Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, we'll be looking at the Ephesians verse today, but really already building off of what uh, you just heard Katie talking about, that uh, at least initially we see in the story of the Old Testament in the, in the Gospel reading that they are missing the point of what Jesus has done, of what God has done, and, and we continue to do the same. And so we're going to take that right as we understand what God has done for us, the salvation that we have, and we're going to look at that Ephesians reading a little bit. Okay, we're going to look at Ephesians 4. Uh, and, and by way of that, I want to start with reviewing a little bit of what we've already heard from Ephesians the past several weeks, because uh, that Ephesians reading has been, been that uh, epistle for us. So in Ephesians chapter 1, we've heard about the blessings of God, that we are redeemed and that we are forgiven. And, and if you're not remembering this, I'd encourage you to go back to Ephesians. It's a, it's a wonderful, it's all wonderful, but a wonderful book to read here. So we have been redeemed, forgiven, chosen by God in chapter 1. Chapter 2, wonderful set of verses. Uh, Ephesians 2, verses 8 to 10, some that you're very familiar with, I, I, I would suspect, that we are saved by grace through faith. Right, it goes on. So that no one may boast, not by works, right, all these things. Uh, created to do those good works. Chapter 3, Paul prays for the strength of believers, prays for us and our very own faith. Okay, so, so those three things at the very beginning of Ephesians, so he, he tells us that you're blessed, you're saved, and to know this, to know that you are those things and that he has prayed for you. And what I want to start with today as we think about that then, as we understand that, because that's nothing new. Right? You've heard this message that we are saved. You've heard this message of what Jesus has done over and over and over again. We have heard that message. And I have another question for you then that, that reminds me of what we do during our confirmation exams. Because during our confirmation exams, we ask kids all sorts of stuff. Right? They have to tell us everything from Ten Commandments to the Lord's Supper and everything in between. But after each question... Each one that's giving us the technical knowledge, so to speak, we ask, sort of ask, so what? Why does this matter, right? Why did God do this? And so I'm asking you today, as you understand that you are blessed, that you are redeemed, forgiven, and chosen by God, what does that mean in your life? You have been saved. That's the promise you, you heard as you received the Lord's Supper. Take, eat, and drink the very body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. As, as you confessed today, reminded of the blessings in baptism as well, right? As, as, as that announcement of forgiveness, that declaration of grace, over and over reminded that we're forgiven. So what? Now what? Paul tells us today. We go back to or go to Ephesians 4. I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, this is Paul writing, he's literally a prisoner, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. You have been saved. You have been rescued from all of those sinful things that you stopped and as you thought about for just a moment. And that moment of silence and those things that you've thought over and over, you have been rescued from those. And Paul says, walk in a manner worthy of the calling. You have been saved for a purpose, not, first and foremost, not to go back to those sinful behaviors. Bonhoeffer talks about a cheap grace that if we understand that we can just keep sinning and, and think that, well, I'll just go and we get some more of God's grace. I'll hear that announcement of forgiveness and, and just keep doing the same thing over and over. We cheapen what Jesus has done. We disregard the fact that Jesus gave his very life, that he suffered and died so that you would have life. And so we, we do not go back over and over. Now, that's not to say, and I'm the first to confess and admit that I do have daily struggles with sin over and over and over again. And, and, I, and I pray the Lord does not give up on me, and he promises not to. 
right? Because we do have those things that we struggle with, but we continue to turn to him, seeking that grace and forgiveness, seeking that new life. And each day we can be reminded in our baptisms, got to talk to folks this week about this, that daily we die, daily we rise again, remembering that God has given us new life each and every day. And that in this, and as he continues today, that we are God's people, that together we are made one. You heard in the readings today, they're old in, in the New Testament, about people together as followers of Jesus. At least in the gospel reading there, right? Uh, but the people spoke out together as God's people, grumbling. Together they grumbled, and together they were saved. Together they were provided for. Too often in our culture today, especially, I think, and, and, and I'm guessing it happens in every country, but our identity seems to first fall on who we are in the countries that we live in and we see ourselves as Americans first, Christians second, or wherever that may be. And our Christian identity should predominate all thinking. History tells us countries rise and fall The word of the Lord endures forever. And together we serve God's purposes. Together we serve his purposes. All Christians, all time together, serve God's purpose. And what is he saying today? He talks about it in this reading. To grow in our faith. So that, and he says here, so that we would not be tossed about like children. Verse 14. We grow in faith so that we would not, we would no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. The world would seek to each and every day, each and every generation, each and every season, to have other things that would draw us away from God's purposes. To forget that we are children of God first. And then we get tossed about like a ship in a storm. That we would know, he says, he calls us to no longer be children to be gullible, mature in faith. You know, all too often we find out that we, at least in our circles, we tend to believe that our Christian instruction ends at catechism, with the confirmation in our catechism. You don't have to raise your hand unless you want to confess as much today, but when was the last time? It's cutting me out on me. In the last year, how many of you have cracked open your catechism? Okay, a couple of you. Some of you say, yeah. How many of you? Josh, good. Chris said yes. <laughs> That's good news. They, they made me do it. So. They made him do it. Real great. <laughs> Don't. Katie said she's going to count that too then. Uh, no. Um, how many of you have cracked open your Bible? A lot of hands not going up, right? How many of you have been to a, well, I'll just say it this way because it's a little easier. How many have not been to a, and don't raise your hand, I don't want you to call yourself out, but you know who you are. How many of you haven't been to a Bible study in a while? How can you be, be mature in the faith if you're not in the word? God invites us to do this daily. We talked about a daily dying and rising, and yet we, we're out of touch with God's word. And if you're relying on what you learned back in confirmation days, I'm sorry, but our memories are not that good. I'll tell you that my memory on a whole lot of stuff is horrible, and if it wasn't for being in the word regularly, I'd have forgotten just as much as I ever knew. You must be in the word. It is a necessity. As much as we talk about the food, this bread of life, you eat every day, you eat regular food every day, and you must feed on the bread of life. You must feed on the word in order to become mature in the faith. Must. There is no getting around it. And it makes your faith weak. It makes your walk with the Lord weak if you're not there. And if you want to challenge me on it, call on after me later on. <laughs> You've got to be in the Word. 
And, and not just as a compulsion and a beating over the head, but as a being fed. The Lord wants to feed you with his word, to strengthen you. I know this past year and a half has been a hard time for many, for all sorts of reasons. There's personal reasons, but, but also I didn't do it, all the political stuff, COVID, whatever it is. And for many of you, it's been a struggle. And I will suggest that for the harder time that it has been, it is because you've been out of, because you've been out of God's word, period. Because you, you do not see the big picture. You do not see that Jesus has conquered all things. He's conquered COVID. He's conquered all the political drama and garbage that's in the world. He's conquered everything that is troublesome with us. And if we rest in him, then we see each and every day that as we die and rise with the new life he's given us, that bread of life, then we don't have to be worried about things each and every day. And in him we have been united as one people and we can see each other not just as the sinful people we are because we do see that and we begin pointing fingers at each other and the divisiveness grows and continues and we start pointing and well, look what they're doing forgetting the sinful broken nature of ourselves and that we are one people united in Christ because we are all broken people in Jesus who have been made whole and at the end of the reading today, Paul encourages us to speak the truth in love. What is the truth? Well, it's just what I said just a second ago. That we together, each and every one of us, are broken sinners. And, and it needs to start with that recognition in here that we see each other, see each other as broken sinners, redeemed Actually, what did Paul say in Ephesians in that first chapter? Redeemed, forgiven, and chosen. We are all broken. Not one of us can claim to be whole outside of Jesus. And that's the good news. Speak the truth in love. As God's people, as broken sinners who have been made whole, by the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That's the good news. As, and, and, and by the way, we tend too often to stop at that thinking of the broken sinner part. And it's true. But that's not the end of the story, right? Just like Good Friday is not the end of the story. Yes, Jesus was crucified on the tomb, but what comes next? What comes after Good Friday? Easter Sunday, the tomb is empty. Alleluia, Christ is risen. too shabby for, for August. That's the good news. Let's speak that truth in love to one another and to everyone we come into contact with. In Jesus' name, amen. And now may the peace of God which surpasses understanding may keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus from now to life everlasting. Amen. Please rise. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you peace.